Arahat Sangamitta's story from the extended Mahavamsa from chapter 5 the third recital Sangamitta's birth formerly in the Mauryan lineage a son called Bindusara was born to the previous king called Chandagutta in the city of Pataliputta and after the death of his father while still growing, he became the king. To that king there were two sons of the same mother, and to those two there were ninety-nine other sons of the king, who were brothers by different mothers. To the eldest of them all, Prince Asoka, the lord of the earth gave the vice-sovereignty over the country of Avanti. Then one day the king came to the attendance hall, and seeing his son, he sent him off, saying, Go to the country and dwell in the city of Ujjaini. In accordance with his father's bidding, he went to Ujjaini by the interior road, and there, in the city of Vedisa, he arranged to make his dwelling in the house of the merchant Deva. Seeing the merchant's daughter, he reflected gladly and thought this, I have heard she is endowed with auspicious marks, wealth, affection, and is amiable. If they will receive these gifts, I will win her favor. They received what was given, and he became intimate with her. After life arose in the womb, she was led to the city of Ujjaini, and there she gave birth to the prince's handsome son called Mahinda and also had a daughter called Sangamitta. When Bindusara was lying on his deathbed, he remembered his son, and sent ministers to fetch him from the city of Ujjaini. They went to Asoka with the news, and announced his bidding, and he went quickly into their presence. He placed his children and wife there on the interior road of the city of Vedisa, and went into his father's presence. When his father died in the city of Pataliputta, he did the proper duties to the body for seven days. Then he had his ninety-nine brothers by different mothers murdered, and raised the royal canopy over himself, and was consecrated right there in the city. After the two children were sent out to the presence of the king, the Venerable Mother herself resided right there in the city of Vedisa. The Going Forth of Sangamitta's Uncle and Husband One day Prince Tissa went hunting and saw deer sporting in the wilderness, and having seen that he thought thus, Even the deer who live on grass enjoy themselves in the wilderness. Will not the monks who live on pleasant food also enjoy themselves? He went to his house and informed the king about his thought. To teach him, Ahsoka gave him sovereignty for seven days, saying, You can experience sovereignty for seven days, young man. After that I will kill you. With the passing of seven days he asked, Why are you so wasted away? Through fear of death, he said, and the king spoke again, saying, Thinking that after seven days you will die, you did not enjoy them. How will the strivers enjoy themselves, dear, when they always contemplate death? Spoken to thus by his brother, he gained faith in the dispensation, and in time, having gone hunting again, he saw the restrained elder Mahadamarakita, pollutant free, being fanned with a sal branch by a naga, and the one with wisdom reflected, When will I go forth in the victor's dispensation, and live in the wilderness like this elder? The elder, in order to instill faith, rose into the sky, went to Ahsoka's monastery, and stood on the water of the pool. He hung the robes he wore in the sky, and descended into the pond and bathed his limbs. 
The prince, having seen this psychic power, gained great faith, and saying, "Today itself, I will go forth." The wise one made a wise decision. He approached and respectfully asked permission from the king for his going forth, and being unable to prevent him, the lord of the world, surrounded by a great retinue, took him to his own monastery. And he went forth in the presence of the elder Mahadamarakita. With him, roughly four thousand other men also received the going forth, but the exact number is not known. The Lord of Men's nephew, called Agi Brahma, well known as the husband of the king's daughter Sangamitta, and their son, who was known by the name of Sumina, after asking permission from the king. Went forth with the prince. The prince's going forth was in King Ashoka's fourth year, and increased the benefit of the multitude. Right there, he received the higher ordination, and having the supporting conditions, while striving, the prince became a worthy one with the six psychic powers. The eighty-four thousand monasteries. All those delightful monasteries he had undertaken to build in all the cities were completed within three years, and through the superintendent elder Indagutta's psychic power, the one called Ashokarama was also completed. In the various places which had been visited by the victorious Buddha. The Lord of the Earth made delightful shrines. From the eighty-four thousand cities on all sides, letters were brought on the same day, saying, "The monasteries are finished." Having heard the letters, the great king of great power, success, and heroism desired to hold great festivals himself at all the monasteries. In the cities, the drum was beaten, and it was announced: a week from this day, all the monasteries must hold a festival at the same time in all directions. On the whole earth, league by league, give a great donation, and make decorations along the pathways and in the village monasteries. In all the monasteries, every day, prepare a great donation for the community of monks. According to the right time and according to ability, with ornamentation of garlands of flowers and strings of lights here and there, and all musical instruments and manifold presents, having taken upon themselves the observances, let every one listen to Dhamma and make innumerable offerings and merit on that day, and every one, everywhere, in every way. In accordance with that order, prepared offerings delighting the heavens. The going forth of Mahinda and Sangamitta. On that day, the great king, decked out with all adornments, together with his harem and ministers, and surrounded by his army, went to his own monastery, as though splitting the whole earth. And after worshiping the supreme community, stood in the midst of the community. In that assembly, there were eight hundred million monks, and of them, one hundred thousand were strivers who had destroyed the pollutants. There were also ninety thousand nuns in that place, and at that time, one thousand nuns had destroyed the pollutants. Those who had destroyed the pollutants performed the miracle called opening the world, for the purpose of instilling confidence in King Dhammashoka. Previously, because of his wicked deeds, he was known as Violent Ashoka, and later, because of his meritorious deeds, he was known as Righteous Ashoka. He looked at the Rose Apple Island. Which is surrounded on all sides by the ocean, and all the monasteries decorated with many offerings, and having seen that, he was very satisfied. And after sitting down, he asked the community, 
Was anyone, venerable sirs, so generous in the dispensation of the greatly fortunate one? The elder Mowgli Putta answered the king's question. Even while the fortunate one was living, there has been no generosity like unto yours. Hearing that statement, the king was very satisfied and asked him, Is there any one who inherits the awakened one's dispensation who is like unto me? The elder saw the supporting conditions of the king's son Mahinda, and similarly of the king's daughter Sangamitta, and seeing the conditions for the growth of the dispensation, being responsible for the dispensation, he answered the king, Even such a one who is greatly generous is not known as an heir in the dispensation. Whoever great king, having amassed a heap of wealth from the plains of the earth up to the tip of the Brahma worlds, and would give it all as a great donation to the community of monks, is still only known as a supporter of material requisites, O ruler of men. But he who lets his son or daughter go forth in the dispensation is a true supporter of the dispensation as well as our material supporter. Then the Lord of the world, wishing to have the nature of a supporter of the dispensation, asked Mahinda and Sangamitta as they were standing there, Will you go forth, dears? Going forth is known as a great thing. Hearing their father's statement, they said this to their father, Today we will go forth if the God King wishes. There will be gain for us and for you in our going forth. Since the time of the Prince Tissa's going forth, the young man Mahinda had naturally desired to go forth, and Sangamitta had made a resolve at her husband Agibrahma's going forth. Although the Lord of the earth desired to give the vice-sovereignty to Mahinda, even more than that, he was pleased with his going forth. His dear son Mahinda, who was wise, handsome and very strong, he let go forth with festivities, and also his daughter Sangamitta. Then Mahinda, the king's joy, was twenty years old, and the king's daughter, Sangamitta, had reached eighteen. On the same day he had the going forth and higher ordination, and on that very day she had the going forth and the placing in training. The prince's preceptor was called Mogali. The elder Mahadeva let him go forth, but Majantika made the formal announcement and in the place of the higher ordination, Mahinda attained worthiness together with the analytic knowledges. Sangamitta's preceptor was the well-known nun Dhammapala, her teacher Ayapala, and in time she also became pollutant-free. They both were lights of the dispensation and helpers of the island of Lanka and they went forth six years after King Dhammashoka came to the throne. The great Mahinda, who brought faith to the island, in his third year learned the three baskets in the presence of his preceptor. The nun, a crescent moon, the monk Mahinda, the son, younger sister and brother, these two were lights of the awakened one's dispensation. The story now moves on around thirteen years. In the meantime, King Ashoka has seen to the reunification of the Sangha and the holding of the Third Council, in which the teachings had been reconfirmed. Following this, the leading monk at the Council had arranged to send missionaries to the border areas. The Arahat Mahinda had been sent to the island of Lanka where he had converted King Devanam Piyatissa and many others. The story picks up as he continues with his teaching mission. From Chapter 15 The Acceptance of the Great Monastery 
The Great Cloud Monastery and Queen Anula. The elephant stall is crowded, said those who had assembled there, and outside the southern gate, in the delightful joy grove, in the king's garden, which was well covered, cool, and grassy, the people reverentially prepared seats for the elders. Having left by the southern gate, the elders sat down there, and the one skilled in Dhamma related the simile of the poisonous snake. In that place, one thousand breathing beings entered into the first path and fruit on that day. And on the second day also, two and a half thousand penetrated the Dhamma. Many women from the great families came there, and after worshipping, sat down, filling the garden. The elder taught the discourse on the fools and the wise, and one thousand of those women entered into the first path and fruit. And so there in that garden, the evening time set in, and therefore the elders departed, saying, We go to the mountain. Seeing them going, men said, The elders have left straight away, and they went and informed the king. The king went quickly, and after going and worshipping the elder, the lord of the planet said, Venerable sir, it is far from here to the mountain in the evening. Live comfortably right here in the joy wood. It is unsuitable being too near to the city, he said. Hearing that, he uttered this statement to the elder. The great cloud grove is neither too near nor too far, delightful, endowed with shade and water. Be pleased to reside there. You should turn back, venerable sir. And the elder turned back. In that place where they turned back, on the banks of the Kadamba River, the shrine called the Turning Shrine was built. The best of charioteers led the elders to the south of the Joywood through the eastern gate in the great cloud grove. There, near the delightful palace, he spread good beds and chairs and said, Dwell comfortably here. The king worshipped the elders and surrounded by his ministers entered the city, but the elders dwelt for the night right there. Having gathered flowers in the morning, the lord of the planet, after approaching the elders and worshipping them with the blossoms, asked, How? Did you live happily? Was the garden comfortable? We did live happily, great king. The garden is comfortable for strivers. He asked, Is a monastery suitable for the community, venerable sir? The elder said, It is suitable. And the one skilled in what was suitable and unsuitable spoke about the receiving of the Bamboo Grove Monastery. Hearing that, the Lord of the world was happy and very joyful. Queen Anula, together with five hundred women, came in order to worship the elders, and after listening to the Dhamma teaching with faithful minds, they entered the second path and fruit. Then Queen Anula had a desire to go forth together with the five hundred women, and said this to the Lord of the world, Today itself we will go forth, if it is your wish, Lord of the earth. Hearing her statement, the king said to the elder, Venerable sir, Queen Anula desires to go forth together with five hundred women. Please give them the going forth. It is not suitable, great king, for us to give the going forth to women. There is in Pataliputta a nun who is my younger sister, Sangamitta by name who is famous and very learned, Lord of men. Bring the southern branch from the great Bodhi tree of the Lord of ascetics, and then also noble nuns 
to the city in the island of Lanka King, as the Bodhi trees of the three self-made Buddhas were planted by the kings, so today the Bodhi tree of the famous Gotama, which has a resplendent halo, should be planted, Lord of the Earth. Send a message into the presence of the king, our father, saying, Let her come, and that elder nun will come and give the going forth to these women. After saying, well said, and taking the noble water jug, the king said, I give this great cloud grove to the community, and sprinkled water over the right hand of the elder Mahinda. As the water fell on the earth with that statement, the earth in excess of four myriads, for two hundred leagues in extent, or a thousand thick, bearing waters to their edge, shook on all sides. Having seen that wonder, fearful, frightened and apprehensive, the guardian of the earth asked, Why does the earth tremble? Do not be afraid, great king. The dispensation of the one of ten powers will be established here, and because of that this earth trembles. The first monastic dwelling place will be in this place. Hearing that statement, the Lord of the world had great faith and offered sweet-smelling jasmine flowers to the elder. From Chapter 18 The Acquisition of the Great Wisdom Tree Requesting Venerable Sangamitta and the Bodhi Tree in order to bring the great Bodhi tree and the elder nun, the Lord of the world, remembering the statement spoken by the elder, on a certain day in the rainy season, while sitting in his own city near the elder, consulted his ministers and urged his nephew, the minister called the Ritta, to undertake these deeds. After considering it and inviting him, he uttered this statement, Dear, after going into the presence of King Dhammashoka, will you be able to bring the elder nun Sangamitta and the great Bodhi tree here? I will be able, God King, to bring these two from there if, after returning here, I am allowed to go forth, Your Honour. You may go, dear, and after bringing the elder nun together with the Bodhi tree and reaching Lanka, you can go forth according to your wish. Having said that, the king sent his nephew, and he took the message of the elder and the king and worshipped them. Leaving on the second day of the bright fortnight in Asayudja, he, being dedicated, boarded a ship in the port of Jambukola and crossed the ocean, and through the power of the elders' determination, on the very day of departure, it arrived at Pataliputta. Then Queen Anula, with five hundred young women, and together with another five hundred women of the harem, having undertaken the ten precepts, pure in the yellow robes, looked forward to the going forth and for the training rules that would come with the elder nun. She made her dwelling in good conduct in the delightful nunnery in a certain district of the town where the Lord of Men had had it made. As these lay women lived in the nunnery, it became well known throughout Lanka as the lay women's monastery. His nephew, Maharitta, having reached King Dhammashoka, spoke the king's message and the elder's message. Your son, Mahinda God King, sent me into your presence. The queen named Anula, your friend, the king Pietissa's brother's wife, O chief of kings, desiring the going forth, has undertaken the ten precepts, together with a thousand women, and lives constantly restrained. 
Please send the elder nun Sangamitta to give the going forth, and together with her a branch from the south side of the great Bodhi tree. Then the minister went into the presence of the elder nun and said this, Noble sister, your brother Mahinda sent me into your presence. Devanam Piatissa's brother's wife, the laywoman called Queen Anula, through having a desire for the going forth, together with a thousand women, lives constantly restrained. Go together with me, and please give them the going forth. Hearing the minister's word, she very quickly went to the father, and the elder nun related the elder's thought. My brother Mahinda has sent these into my presence, and after we have sent the people back, I will go. Very many people, daughters of good families, with Anular at their head, desiring the going forth, are looking forward to my journey. The king, who was flushed, hearing the elder nun's statement, with a shower of tears set rolling, said this to the elder nun, My son Mahinda dear, and my grandson Sumana, having left us here, I am as though with my hands cut off. They both have gone to the copper dust island. I no longer see them, and great grief has arisen. Seeing their faces today, your grief will be allayed, but not seeing you also, dear, how will I put aside my grief in being parted from my son and grandson? Enough, dear, if you were to go today, you also will not return. Hearing the statement of her father, the elder nun said this, My brother's word has importance for me, king, together with the request of the great queen and the thousand women. Further, I suppose, this is not just my brother's word, and many are waiting for the going forth, which I also desire to give, great king, and so now I must go. If you desire to go, take a branch of the supreme Bodhi tree and go, noble sister. You must see your brother in Lanka. Festivities for the Bodhi Tree On the first day of the bright half of the month Katika, the guardian of the world, Ashoka, placed a branch of the great Bodhi Tree to the east of the root of a lovely great Sala tree, and worshipping it day by day, on the seventeenth day new shoots started taking hold and arose on the trunk of the delightful Bodhi Tree. Seeing that the Lord of the world, his mind faithful and satisfied, with his ten fingers raised in reverential salutation to his head, said, I give it sovereignty over the whole of the Rose Apple Island. And the Lord of the world consecrated the great Bodhi tree with sovereignty. The novice Sumana, who was sent by Mahinda in order to take a relic of the teacher, together with his bowl, on the full moon day of Katika, flew through the sky and arrived in the delightful city of flowers. At that time the great Bodhi tree had been placed at the root of the lovely Sala tree, and in that place he saw them worshipping with the offerings at the Katika festival. The Lord of the planet placed a guard around the Bodhi tree and dwelt near it together with his council of ministers. All the women of the harem, with Sangamitta at their head, went out from the city and worshipped it with all sorts of offerings, and they dwelt near the great Bodhi tree together with their husband. The worship of the beautiful, noble, excellent Bodhi tree with many and extensive flags, flowers and fruits at its head, open the minds of men and the protective guards, like a lotus opened by the rays of the sun, without any effort on its part. 
The blossoming flowers in the lakes of Pataliputta delighted the minds of the people and the protective gods. After emitting six colorful rays in the sky and on the ground, and instilling faith in all the people, it dwelt there like an awakened one. From Chapter 19 The Journey of the Great Bodhi Tree Venerable Sangamitta and the Bodhi Tree set out for Lanka. In order to protect the great Bodhi tree, the best of charioteers appointed eighteen from royal families, and eight from ministerial families, eight from Brahmana families, eight from merchants' families, and from the foremost and faithful cowherders' families, the sparrow weavers, the potters' families, the hyena families, eight of each were also appointed. He sent Nagas and Yakas together with their assembly and sprinkled with water brought for the purpose day by day and gave eight gold and eight silver water pots as was desired. Then taking the great Bodhi tree and worshipping it in various ways he said In whatever way you like, go from city to city. The ruler of men, surrounded by his army, dismissing them, went immediately with his elephants, horses and chariots, and by crossing through the jungle called the Vinchar forest, he arrived at Tarmaliti within seven days. The guards, nagas and men quickly assembled on the highway and worshipped the Bodhi tree in the way they liked, and worshipped it with a great offering day by day, with manifold heavenly musicians' music and song, and going gradually, they also arrived on the seventh day. The Lord of the world placed the great Bodhi tree on the bank of the great ocean, and worshipped it with various offerings for seven days, and the guardian of the world, the best of charioteers, consecrated the great Bodhi tree with sovereignty over the whole of the Rose Apple Isle. On the first day of the lunar fortnight, in the bright half of Magasira, he raised the great Bodhi tree with help given by eight of each from the high-born families appointed at the root of the Sal tree with all kinds of offerings. He descended into the water up to his neck and established it properly on the ship and invited the great elder Sangamitta with eleven other nuns onto the ship with various offerings. Then he uttered this statement to the chief minister Maharitta. This great Bodhi tree, dear, I consecrated three times with sovereignty over the whole of the Rose Apple Isle. Now, after bringing the great Bodhi tree myself and arranging all kinds of ceremony here in the port town, I descended up to my neck into the water and established it on the ship with the elder nun Sangamitta. Seeing that you are sent back from the city to my friend, the king should also worship it with sovereignty in the same way. As I have made all kinds of ceremonies and offerings, my friend the great king Deva Nampiatissa should also make all the offerings that have been made by me. Having given this advice to his friend, the resplendent guardian of the world, lamenting tearfully, uttered this statement. Alas, the Bodhi tree of the virtuous one, the one of the ten powers, while it is still emitting a net of twenty coloured rays, we have gladly given it up. Having said this, the great king after making reverential salutation with his head, seeing the great Bodhi tree going with the elder nun, stood depressed on the bank with a shower of tears set rolling. While watching the ship with the great Bodhi tree on board going from the multitude and the king, after crossing the water some way, the waves settled down for a league all round on the great sea. 
Five coloured lotuses on all sides blossomed, and in the firmament manifold instruments played. Manifold offerings were made by the gods, and the nagas worked magic in order to seize the great Bodhi tree. The great elder Sangamitta, who had gained the strength of psychic powers, took the form of a supana and frightened the great snakes. Trembling and fearful, seeing the spiritual power and the splendor of the great elder nun, they worshipped the elder's feet with their heads and begged for their lives, saying, "Don't be angry with us, noble sister." On this journey today, there will be no obstacle for you. You will be safe. We have come in order to ask for the Bodhi tree. She gave the great Bodhi tree to the Nagas to worship, and they took the great Bodhi tree to the dragon's abode. They worshipped it with various offerings and gave it sovereignty over the Naga realm for seven days. Brought it back. And placed it on the ship, and that same day the ship arrived at Jambukola in Lanka. King Damashoka, affected with grief over separation from the great Bodhi tree, helpless, looked longingly towards that region, and after making great lamentation, he went back to his city. Reception in Lanka. King Devanampiyatissa, who delighted in the benefit of the world, had heard from the novice Sumana about the day of the arrival of the Bodhi tree, and from the first day that began the month of Magasira, he decorated the highway from the north gate as far as Jambukola with silver leaves of cloth. Strewn like sand that had been sprinkled all round on the highway, from the day the king went out from the city, he waited at the grounds of the reception hall by the ocean, and there the Lord of the Earth, through the psychic power of the great elder nun, saw the great Bodhi tree coming in the middle of the great ocean, decked out in all its splendor, and by the power of Mahinda. He drew as though close to it. In that place, a hall was made to display the wonders which became well known as the Ocean Reception Hall. After leaving the Ocean Reception Hall and standing outside, while raising the pandal, he saw both of the roads strewn all round with five-coloured flowers and various flags and cloves. Together with priceless flowers, great water pitchers, all full with lilies, the guardian of the world, having placed them at intervals on the road, through the power of the great elder, together with the other elders, after leaving, in one day had reached Jambukola. The Lord of the Earth, driven by joy at the coming of the great Bodhi tree. Plunged into the water up to his neck, and raised the beautiful body of the great Bodhi tree on his head. He emerged from the ocean, placed it aside with all offerings, and placed it under the care of the sixteen families in that lovely pavilion. For three days on the shore of the ocean, the Lord of Lanka, having adorned it, worshipped it with sovereignty over Lanka. Venerable Sangamitta and the Nunneries, near the Lord's great Bodhi tree, through the wonder of being near the flag of the true Dhamma, preached in the lovely words of the land of Lanka, Queen Anula, with five hundred women, and together with five hundred women of the harem, received the going forth in the presence of the elder Sangamitta. And those one thousand nuns, after developing insight, in no long time attained the state of worthiness. The great elder Sangamitta lived in the nunnery known as the Laywomen's Monastery, together with her community. 
She made there three dwelling places which were considered the foremost. Previously, Queen Anula had heard a Dhamma teaching in the elder Mahinda's presence, understood the truths, donned the yellow robes, undertook the ten precepts, and made her dwelling in the home of the minister called Dolaka. Afterwards, with the coming of the elder nun to the island of Lanka, these three foremost palaces, small chapter, great chapter, and increasing splendor, were made by the Lord of the world. For the benefit of his retinue and many others in the palace, when the great Bodhi tree was brought in the ship, the ruler of the world had the mass placed in the house named the small chapter. The sail was established in the great chapter house, and then the rudder was placed in the increasing splendor house. The Lord of the world, who was of such a kind, endowed with virtue and respect for the three treasures, paid lifelong respect to the Bodhi tree, and caused all the places in the isle to be prepared, gaining a famous name, lasting even until today. The king's state elephant, which wandered wherever it liked, stayed on one side of the city in a cool spot in a mountain grotto, near to a Kadamba pupper bush, where it grazed. Often people journeyed there, and after seeing the elephant and saying, This elephant delights in the Kadamba grove, fed it with rice and fattened up the elephant, and that place came to be known by the name of the measure of grain. One day the elephant didn't take even a morsel, and the king asked the elder who brought faith to the island the reason. Near the Kadamba Puppa bush site he desires that a sanctuary be built, the great elder said to the great king. The king, who was ever delighting in the welfare of the people, quickly built a sanctuary there, together with a relic and a sanctuary room. The great elder Sangamitta, who longed for an empty abode, as the dwelling place she lived in was crowded, seeking the benefit of the dispensation and the welfare of the nuns, being wise and desiring another nunnery, went to that lovely shrine house which was comfortably secluded and spent the day there, she who had faultless skill in dwellings. The king, after going to the first nunnery, in order to worship the elder nun, heard that she had left the place. He departed from the nunnery, arrived near the shrine house, and worshipped the great elder. After exchanging greetings with the elder Sangamitta, understanding her intention, the guardian of the world, who was a wise man skilled in intentions, a hero of great power, had a delightful nunnery built near the sanctuary house. The nunnery was built near where the elephant took his measure of grain, therefore it became well known as the Elephant's Measure Monastery. The good friend, the great elder Sangamitta, who was greatly wise, then made her dwelling in that delightful nunnery. Thus benefiting the world of Lanka and accomplishing the development of the dispensation, the great Bodhi tree, endowed with various wonders, remained for a long time in the great cloud grove in the delightful island of Lanka. From Chapter 20 The Complete Emancipation of the Elders The Passing of Arahat Mahinda After the King Devanam Pietisa's passing, his younger brother, well known as Uttia, also born of King Muttasiva, ruled righteously. The elder Mahinda was the light of Lanka, a leader of a great crowd, who lit up the island of Lanka, 
who propagated the supreme dispensation of the victor, consisting of proper study, practice and penetration. He who was like the teacher benefited many in the world in Lanka with a virtuous crowd of wise monks in the community. In the eighth victorious year of the King Uttia, within the rains retreat, after he had dwelt sixty years near the Chaitya mountain, on the eighth day of the bright half of the month Asayudja, that passionless elder, who increased the light, attained emancipation. As the passionless Mahinda passed on the eighth day, it was agreed upon that his name be given to the eighth day. Hearing that, King Uttia was affected by the dart of grief, and after going, worshipping and lamenting the elder a great deal, he had the body of the elder quickly laid out in a golden casket that had been sprinkled with perfumed oil. He placed that perfect casket in a golden bier and lifted it, and while making righteous ceremonies with a great flood of people who had come together from here and there, he made various offerings with a great army of people. Going through the city's decorated path that had many decorations, they lifted and carried the bier along the highway and led it to the great monastery, together with the assembly, and placed the decorated bier there. The guardian of the world celebrated in the mango question enclosure for seven days with arches, flags and flowers, with pots full of incense, adorned for a distance of three leagues around the monastery. This was through the power of the king, but the whole island was decorated through the power of the gods. The lord of the world made many offerings for a week, then, in the eastern direction, in the elder's enclosure, he made circumambulation of the fragrant pyre near the great sanctuary, and led the delightful beer to that place, and placed it on the pyre, paying his final respects. After lighting the fire, and sprinkling with perfumed water, the Lord of the Earth, right there in the Elder's cremation spot, made a shrine and deposited the relics there, as was fit. The ruler of men had half of his relics deposited in the Chaitya mountain and deposited the rest of the relics in all the monastic sanctuaries, and he made offerings day by day. The place where the sage's body had been laid is called, out of respect for him, the seer's courtyard. Therefore, after bringing the body of the noble ones from three leagues all round, they were burned in that place. The Passing of Arahat Sangamitta the great elder Sangamitta, of great power, great intelligence, fulfilled all duties to the dispensation with virtue and wisdom, and benefited many people in the delightful island of Lanka. Nine years after the beginning of the reign of King Uttia, fifty-nine years after arriving, while residing in the elephant's measure house, this light of the world passed away. Hearing that, King Uttia, affected by the dart of grief, with a shower of tears set rolling, went out with his assembly, and just as for the elder Mahinda, he made supreme offerings and paid respect to the elder nun for a week in that place, and decorated the whole of Lanka as for the elder Mahinda. After seven days, the elder's body was placed on top of a bier and was led round the delightful city with the assembly, and the guardian of the world, placing the decorated bier aside near to the beautiful hall, in sight of the great Bodhi tree, on the eastern side of the sanctuary monastery, 
in the place indicated by the elder nun had the cremation carried out. The Lord of the world, Uttia, also had a sanctuary built in that place. Having taken her relics, he deposited them in the sanctuary, and he worshipped there day by day with all kinds of offerings. The Passing of Other Elders Also the five great elders, Ittia, Uttia, the great elder Badasala, and the greatly intelligent Sambala and Mahinda, these five, being without pollutants, attained emancipation. Also, beginning with the great elder Aritta, greatly wise and skillful, after skillfully teaching many students in the discipline, doctrine and abstract doctrine, being expert in discrimination, together with innumerable thousands of monks who had destroyed the pollutants, passed away. Also the twelve elder nuns beginning with Sangamitta, and many thousands of nuns who had destroyed the pollutants, who were learned, greatly wise in the discipline of the victor's tradition, after showing the light shining forth and lighting up the earth like a mass of fire, being pollutant-free, attained emancipation. King Uttia made his reign for ten years. Being oppressed by disease, he attained the state of impermanence. Just so is the whole impermanent world heading for destruction. That man who, knowing that impermanence is very violent, strong and unstoppable, doesn't grow weary of coming to existence and being tired of it, doesn't have disgust for wicked things and doesn't delight in meritorious things, because of the strength of his great delusion, is one who, though knowing the truth, forgets it. <laughs>